what am I doing? You know, and I, I, I wanted to take the stance as I knew many of my African American colleagues across the firm were having and waiting. Let me just wait and see what my firm is going to do. But I am the only black female or I mean female or male member of my leadership team. And I'm not on that team to be silent. So I spoke up, spoke to a lot of members of my leadership and implored and impressed that they needed to speak now. They responded in kind, which was great. Um, but what I found in even speaking with my own team, the team that I manage, not only were my African-American employees suffering, but my non-white employees were suffering because they saw the injustices, they saw the pain that their black employees were in and they didn't know how to connect. They didn't know how to ask the question. They didn't know how to support their African-American employee uh, co-workers in discussing a topic that is so difficult. You know, and I realized how difficult that conversation is in talking to my white colleagues across the firm and some corporate leadership and having a little grace and understanding that they don't know what to say. They don't know how to communicate with us in this kind of time for fear of saying the wrong thing. So my comment is, it's not a question, just my comment is, is to encourage the conversation. Don't be afraid when they do reach out to be honest, because in my honesty, I, I have hope. I have hope when they finally they listen, they acknowledge, and they want to do something. They want to do something. And it, it feels genuine. And I want to hold them accountable to that. So I just I just implore again, don't be afraid to if you if you're not getting anything from your leadership, if you're not being reached out to the relationships that you do have, reach out to them and let them know you're not okay. Your teams are not okay. We need to do something and we need to do better. So that that's that's what I wanted to just make sure that you know, it's not it it is our our, our challenge but we live with it. We live with this every day and we come to work silent every day. But now is not the time to be silent and they're ready to have the conversation. All right, thank you. And uh, please go back to mute. Um, and, and just to comment on that, um, I've heard that a lot at Jacobs. Uh, don't know what to say. You don't know what to say when somebody dies, but you figure it out. So tell them, hey, when somebody passes away, you may not know what to say, but say something. Uh, we will correct you if it's wrong. And uh, something I've been sharing with people all week, uh, be bold in your conversation. and Don't be afraid to let people know how you feel. Uh, it's really time for us to take off the mask. We're going to go uh, to Tamika Monteville. What's up, Tamika? How's Florida? How's Orlando? And uh, glad. Hey, everybody. How y'all doing? Can y'all hear me? Yes. Excellent. Okay. I'm not doing well. Um, 13 years ago, when I worked for Freddie, we had a new, new team members coming together. So in his wisdom, he hired an awesome doctor to facilitate communication between the old heads and the new heads. And one of the most poignant statements she made was, silence is violent agreement. It's silent around here, y'all. And I'm not comfortable with that. Now, with my direct reports, I've communicated. We've talked about the pain. I've taken the mask off. And even today, microaggressions of the day, I'm only coming in here two days a week. And even in this week, it's too much. I appreciate 
leadership asking me as the black person and we have three directors who are black asking two of us to review the statement that is proposed to go out it was fire it wasn't that tacit we're going to work together diversion you know diversity and inclusion no it was direct and to the point my heart broke when I learned that it's an iterative process and that statement, it will go out eventually. George Floyd's family, you know, almost two weeks after his death and I'm in an agency that is so tone deaf and not recognizing and I'm tired, quite honestly. You know, I, I had a heavy conversation with a close white girlfriend who asked me, Tamika, how do you feel about the defamation of Robert E. Lee's statue? And I just said, do you see statues of Hitler in Germany? It's that simple to us because we know but the challenge for me is going through the coming weeks, being the heart of my team, which is multi-diverse, Generation Z, X, P, boomers, everything, young, old, or from around the world. And they get it and they understand and they needed something. But leadership is lacking and quite honestly, the burden of carrying this is our everyday burden as African-Americans, as black people. I'm a child of the 70s, I'm black. We were black when I grew up, so. You know, we really have to recognize that the leadership in many of our organizations, large private firms, as Sharon just mentioned, they don't have the tools, but they're still being silent. And that makes me, pissed quite frankly i'm pissed i'm pissed because you can still dispense these microaggressions every day but you can't send a statement out and that doesn't take a political will that doesn't take that's humanity and that's what's missing and so i'm frustrated right now and i don't have to preach to this choir up here in this church but after this call i will be relinquishing the burden of coming in here with the mask on. And I'm ready to have the conversations, but I don't think many of our organizations are ready. And I thank you, Comto, for, for just being Comto, and, and thank you, thank you so much. All right, thank you, Tamika. And uh, we're gonna keep it moving, and we appreciate your uh, comments, Tamika. Uh, we're gonna go to Tony from Detroit. Tony, are you still there? Please unmute yourself. Okay. All right. If we, all right, Tony may not be available. Uh, we have a board member, a Comto board member on the line, uh, Adelie Legrand. I think she was able to make it via phone. Adelie, you want to go ahead? Uh, we have uh, someone else in the chat right now while Adelie's uh, on, on deck. Uh, we have Christopher Tomlinson, and then Tony hey, also typed in his uh, question as well. Okay. Go ahead, Chris. I managed to unmute myself as well. It's good to see everyone. Um, yeah, these 2020's been, uh, I don't know what to call this year. Um, between George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, um, here in Georgia, it's, it's, it's just interesting and difficult. Uh, the impact it's having on my children, especially, um, the conflict I feel between them wanting to participate in protests and not knowing what may occur. Um, what, 
one thing I've done in my organization, I did send out uh, a message and have been responding individually to each of those comments uh, that I've received back. Um, proud to state that a lot of my managers have initiated conversations in their group, um, be, be those managers black or white, um, just to just have conversations. And that's what we've been encouraging people to do. It's, as Freddie said, it's not about having the right words. It's about uh, starting to talk about these issues. One thing I've personally been doing, um, and it goes back to the earlier comments about it's something we live with every day, is making sure that the Christian Cooper Central Park issue is part of the conversation so that people recognize that, especially amongst black professionals, we may be able to not be in the direct situation that George Floyd unfortunately found himself in, but the fear that comes from knowing that someone can just look at you as a threat and you can have the exact same result is something that is uh, shocking to those who don't live it every day. And reminding them of that fact, um, I, I think has been important. Um, the question of where we go next, how we take the conversations forward, um, is one that still trying to see what's the best or most effective way and the last thing I would say, um, the thing that's bothering me the most is the focus on the riots and the damage instead of the underlying issue that's leading to it is, is one of the most frustrating parts of, of this entire uh, conversation situation. And, and so trying to get back to either why there's riots, because I don't agree with the damage um, and even reminding people that when you look at um, even back to Kaepernick kneeling and everyone went to talk about the fact that he was kneeling instead of why. So, so hopefully we can turn this an opportunity to, to continue the conversation on the underlying cause as opposed to just the most immediate results of it. So, so again, I thank Hanta for, for the forum because I think it's just as important to just have a place to talk and not keep it pent up. So thank you. Ready, we All right, thank you. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, uh, Gaturi. Before we go to Dwayne Sampson, followed by Keith Parker, I do want to read uh, Tony's comment. What were you going to say, Gaturi? No, I was just going to, you go ahead. All right. Uh, Tony from Detroit said, these recent events are nothing new and it weighs so hard on my heart. As a Lebanese American, I know the struggles the minorities in marginalized communities go through here and overseas. I have been wanting to go out and join the demonstrations. However, I feel as a public sector employee, I am limited by the entity I represent. Can anyone weigh in on the issue on how to protect partake in the demonstrations and support of the masses when you are a public servant. So please keep that in mind. Um, I don't know, Dwayne, you might this have some. This is right. Hey, yeah, hey right. you, can do what you, you can do what you want to do on your own time. As long as you're not on their time, you, if you're on their time, no, you can't. But you can do what you want to do on your own time with federal employees or state, federal, local employees. That's the bottom line. All right, that was a passionate answer to that question. Thank you, Brad. Um, let's keep it moving and go to Dwayne Sims. Well, good afternoon, all. You know, uh, certainly trying times, but I must say it, it's good to see or hear uh, most of you. It's, it's been some time, and I, I certainly appreciate all of you. Those of you who really know me know that. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm usually at home, but I'm here in the in epicenter in Brooklyn, New York, and, and I might get out once every 10 days. Uh, things are starting to ease up just a little, 
but uh, we are uh, still a little bit fearful knowing uh, we had uh, in New York State body counts of seven, 800 a day for a period. So, uh, so it's certainly quite concerning. But the COVID-19 and, 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 and the, the George Floyd flood and, and others circumstances, it actually, uh, it's gonna produce sort of a restart that I believe, a restart for, for equality, uh, liberation and freedom, and for folks that 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 have a voice that's that's heard now, and and that sort of uh, a thing that you just can't put back into a bottle. So the conversations are going to have to continue, because that sense of pride and independence and 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 wanting to be equal and to be free is is a right that every basic human being seeks. Um, I think that we are approaching a very dangerous time. I think that the United States and the world is, is on the brink of viewing themselves in, uh, in, in the greatest experiment. And that experiment is probably going to be a sense of socialism. Because, and I, and I view this as people for a time may not have money for food, may not have shelter. A lot of the basic items that government have to provide with 43 million people out of work in the United States alone. In a month or two, you, you typically folks that live paycheck to paycheck, two or three months, it's game over. So we really need to be thinking about the social benefits and supporting each other as these times get increasingly, increasingly more critical. Thank you. All right, thanks, Dwayne. We appreciate that. Um, we're gonna move on to Keith Parker. Good afternoon, Comto family. Um, like Chris Tomlinson for a few minutes ago, joining you from Georgia. Uh, those of you who know me uh, know I'm a pretty optimistic uh, person, always looking for the next way to move forward. And, and that's why I've approached this week with such optimism. Uh, like you, Freddie, I've been on a lot of calls and a lot of discussions uh, with, uh, particularly this week, with a lot of corporate CEOs uh, from, you know, from the Georgia area as well as from around the country. And uh, and then in addition, we had a very good call with the uh, Goodwill CEOs. Many of you know I left uh, Public Transit to run Goodwill of North Georgia, and there are no, there are another 158 CEOs from around the country, only four of whom are African American. And so in these conversations, people have been challenging us as African Americans to speak up, sort of tell what's going on with you. And then I've watched as their uh, eyes and mouths have been just wide open, saying, holy smokes, so that can happen to someone like you, Keith, like you and your family can have a negative interaction with police, but you're like one of these good guys. You know, you, you're never the type who would ever uh, get in trouble or, or that sort of thing. And I, and I stress, we all, no matter how many zeros we have behind uh, our paychecks, we all are at the end of the day in this same sort of struggle of uh, trying to find racial justice, racial equality. But I want to take it further than just reflecting on bad stuff because uh, I want us to be thinking about how we leverage this moment and move forward. So, you know, one of the other boards that I serve on, I'm the, the CEO, I'm the chairman and rector of Virginia Commonwealth University, and we happen to have a meeting just this morning. So, part of, you know, that's right in the middle of Richmond, Virginia, where the governor of Virginia just announced a couple of days ago, if you've been to Richmond, one of the most prominent things in the entire Commonwealth is this gargantuan Confederate statue of Robert E. Lee on, on, on his horse uh, 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 in the center of Monument Avenue along the state capitol. The, the governor has announced that statue is coming down. And the Richmond City Council has uh, supported seeing that happen as well. 
we need to make sure we're giving our voice to support these types of efforts. So part of our conversation this morning with the DCU board and, and beyond was that the university is going to not just uh, be silent and staying back. We're going to take a very lead, we're, take, we're going to take a big leadership role in facilitating conversations and leading the way for uh, racial reconciliation, racial justice, and what happened. Third thing I would mention is everybody owes it to themselves and their families, their communities to get knowledgeable about this topic. It's not enough just to be frustrated. We need to know how we got here. And there's a ton of really good literature out there to read. I could rattle off 20 books to you to take a look at, but if you can only read one and know where you, how we got from the end of slavery, re, uh, reconstruction to today, and maybe just a couple of years ago when Charlottesville hit, take a look at Henry Louis Gates' latest book, uh, Stony the Road, because he chronicles how we moved from reconstruction to what they call redemption in the South, Jim Crow, all those things in between to where we are now. It's, it, you need that knowledge to be able to have effective debates to people who will not be supported. Last thing I'll mention is I'm so just pleased and, and, and feel gratified that it's not just African-Americans who are on this call this afternoon, that we've got, uh, our, uh, we've got white brothers and sisters who I think are going to be quite committed and seeing progress move forward as well. So I applaud them for being on here, and I expect that we'll be challenging uh, some of our brothers, some of our white brothers and sisters, to help us take these next steps forward as well. So thank you, Freddie, for the platform. Good to see everybody. Let's keep up the fight. All right, thank you, Keith. And uh, the next up, and uh, Keith, we really appreciate those comments as well. I want to make sure I say that. Um, Next up is Paul Scatellis. Hi, Freddie. Uh, thanks to you and to Brad for, for organizing this session here. Um, for those who may not know me that may be on the call, uh, you know, I'm APTA a president, and we certainly from, well, let me start first with a personal perspective here. Uh, I have to believe um, if I'm gauging my feelings, which uh, I would describe in lots of different ways, but certainly distressed uh, and upset as to what we've witnessed in particular over this past week, uh, what set all this off uh, this week, uh, I know that that's shared, and I have to believe it's shared by tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of people out there. We as APTA, um, I addressed uh, this issue with, uh, with my team in terms of a written note earlier this week and then an all staff meeting that we had. And then of course, APTA, myself and Nuri Fernandez issued a statement uh, as well. My question really is, because the issues are, are, are deep, they're hurtful, uh, they're, they're issues that we need to deal with as a country and a people for racial equality. The question really is, how do we do it? And I think this, it really does beg the question, aside from sharing our feelings, which I think is important, so we know where people sit and where they stand. More importantly, how do we go forward? Keith mentioned a, mo a moment ago, what is the way forward? Um, and so I appreciate you all taking this step. My challenge to all of us and to myself and to APTA and to all of you is, can we fashion a set of actions, a, a set of follow-ons to help us deal with this, this issue? Um, how can we engage with, with one another in meaningful dialogue about what needs to be done? Again, aside from us, you know, saying we're hurt, which we are, uh, how do we translate this into positive movement, a positive action forward, aside from just sharing with one another the feelings, which are really important. They, they, they establish a baseline, they establish a commonality. But I think the real challenge for us here, and I take it personally as at APTA, is what can we be doing to take this to a meaningful level that really will engage in a way to make a difference? And I, and I pledge a, a way to work with Compto in this uh, and others that want to be engaged in this effort. So, uh, thanks again for having it, uh, for having this session, and hopefully it's the beginning, uh, um, springing off what has transpired here for us to make some positive change going forward. So thank you. Yeah, just a quick, uh, we appreciate that quick response from Keith. Ready? Yes. Yes. Um, That's right. Okay. Okay. Outside, outside, we follow, Keith. 
Thank you. Thanks, Keith. Real quickly, I want to make sure that I reach out and I'm going to reach out to uh, Paul to uh, start uh, some kind of structured dialogue with uh, with APTA and all of its affiliations. Uh, one of the things that I did on the uh, APTA DNI call last week was uh, I want to make sure that as we go forward as Tomto and as APTA that you know this issue is going to be addressed and we're going to move forward we'll move forward as an industry uh together on this i will gather others from other parts of the transportation industry as well that i'm affiliated with uh more intimately too to get uh, uh a, a broader dialogue going and something that that paul has mentioned so i just want to take that up and want to let you guys know that my intention is <laughs> okay yeah, thank you. Looking forward to seeing how we how that plays out. I know Keith, you wanted a quick response, and then we have some other folks in the queue. Go ahead, Keith. I did. I so appreciate the sincerity of my friend Paul Scatellis in his question. And actually, I think one of the ways we can move forward is by looking back a bit with what APTA has done in the past. One of the most, and and I've shared this with some of these corporate Fortune 500 CEOs and others about how we and particularly the leadership of, of uh, Comto and some of the pioneers of, uh, of our journey here in the public transit business helped lead the way. I see Bob Prince is uh, one of the folks on, on, this, uh, on this call. A couple of decades ago, I remember sitting at an after conference and folks were fed up because we had just yet an, another time had seen an election go by when nobody, uh, no African Americans have been uh, selected in the leadership of AFTA. Yet another two or three CEO searches had gone by, and yet the, and, and, and the same old folks whose names were same great folks whose names had been put, put up for these possible opportunities had been turned down. And so a collective group went to AFTA with some challenges, some direct challenges about how we could make uh, make a difference. And so some, some very specific things happened. Uh, and, and overall, what, what took place was we mainstreamed diversity in action. We did not make diversity an initiative or one, a one-off. It became something that became mainstream in the whole of what AFTA's DNA would be about. So we went to the headhunters and, uh, and uh, job search leaders to tell them your job descriptions are causing African Americans not to have an opportunity to really win any of these positions. That if you keep the job descriptions written in such a way that uh, it, it's uh, created almost an exclusive white male business, you'll continue to have all white males in these, uh, in these positions. We really push the need to have diversity and pushing DBEs to have a real seat at the table, a real opportunity to win uh, some of these awards. And now today you look, you fast forward and you see African-Americans in some of the most prominent positions in our industry. You see the DBE numbers for after conferences and whatnot have gone up dramatically over these times. So this is all to say the way we go about this, Paul, is to be quite intentional about it. That we, uh, that you work with Brad and, and, and his folks, you may want to pull together a, uh, a task force of some type, and then we go from there setting out some goals because the only thing that you'll attain is what can be measured. And we need to set some goals, measure them along the way, and make it happen. So again, thank you all for taking all the call for you. Keith, thank you. I really appreciate you sharing with us some of that history uh, and, and also the challenge uh, for us. And, and I think we're up to the task. I do believe that. Let, let, let's come together and see what we can do, Adva advance this, this issue and this cause. All right, thank you both. Um, I'm going to go to Getwiri. Getwiri, I think you may have a couple of comments you want to share with us, and then maybe you can tell us. Uh, I think we have Laverne up next, but I think you have a couple of comments you might want to share, and then we'll go to Laverne, correct? Sure. Um, before we go to Laverne, I'll share uh, Maxine Small's comment. She says, I think we need to remember who has perpetuated the perception of Black people as criminals. So the press focusing on the looting with as much importance as the protest should not be surprising. It is essential that we supersede their mixed messaging with our own messaging using social media. 
Uh, that was one of Maxine's comments. I'll read uh, her other question. Uh, what does justice reform look like? What does social reform look like? What does economic justice look like? So thank you, Maxine, for your comments. And if, I don't know if you want to respond, Freddie, or if you want to go on to Laverne McGillity. I'll, I'll just say that I don't know if any of us have the magic bullet to the answer to any of those questions. We certainly, uh, those are topics that have been debated for a long time. Uh, but I certainly appreciate you sharing, Maxine, and that is documented. And uh, we're going to go ahead to uh, Laverne. Laverne, are you still there? Take yourself off mute, please. Okay. Um, the next person we have um, is Yvette Holder. Hi, everyone. Uh, sorry, I can't show myself. There's not enough uh, webcams available. Um, but I think, you know, just from my voice, you'll you'll get the gist of what's going on in my head. Um, I'm the mother of <clears throat> three daughters. I don't know what it's like to raise a black man, um, a, a black boy into a young man, into a, a grown man and, and keep him safe in today's times. I see what is happening. And from a mother's perspective, whether it's a daughter or your son, we have to keep them safe. How do we keep them safe when there is so much institutionalized racism that is so covert that a lot of us, you know, we don't understand the strategy. They, these are strategic initiatives that white supremacy has put in place since slavery, and they've managed to change the face of it, but still keep it in place. Like that's the type of uncovering that we have to be able to do. I agree, we don't have the, uh, there, there's not just one answer, right? And, and I agree, I think that a platform like this is what, you know, opens that ability up for people to join forces and say, we're going to focus on X. Another team is going to focus on Y and continue it forward. We have a tremendous amount of grassroots initiatives, but we need to make sure we're all connected and that there's no gaps because every time there's a gap, we fall further behind. This week was the first time that at work, I had to literally say, I am not okay. I'm not. I tossed and turned this weekend. I couldn't even sleep come Monday morning. I was, you know what? Having the pandemic was a savior for me because I didn't have to go into work. We have a new CTO, uh, Chief Technology Officer. And he's Russian. He had a town hall this week that had already been uh, set up for his management team. And I have to say that the one thing I was happy about was that he opened the floor up to say, I don't have an answer for what's going on, but I can tell you coming from where I come from in Russia and come into the United States, I don't get it. I don't get the racism. I think it's the ugliest part of the United States and I think it needs to be eradicated. Well, maybe you don't have the answers, but if that's the platform that you're gonna open up so that we can have that conversation and figure it out together, to me, that was a step in the right direction. You know, we had Bloomberg who put racial profiling in play. And then years later, we have him running for the presidency of the United States, where he thinks a speech in Tulsa, Oklahoma, 
for him to apologize and say it was wrong and to talk about the wrongs that happened to us in black during Black Wall Street, that's not enough. I'm sorry. And I'm, I'm glad he's not that nominee. But there's a lot of positions in the judicial system where white supremacy lives and it lives strong. All of what we're seeing now is all the doors opening up, all those closets opening up that have been closed for so many years because now the leader is, is uh, the leader that we have in the White House allows for this type of behavior and hatred to continue. For me, by majority vote, he lost. By majority vote, he'll lose again. But have we corrected the pathway in which he was able to win even without the majority vote, because he's putting people in place who have lifetime positions. These folks want to continue to make money off of us as minorities. We need to be in those positions. Thank you. Yvette, thank you for that. Uh, we are, we can we can feel you even though we can't see you. Um, who do we have next, Gentuiri? Uh We have Dennis, and then we have Nuria Fernandez. Dennis, are you still there? Please unmute yourself. Hi, Hi Ram. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Canto. Um, Dennis Howland. I'm in the District of Columbia. I work for DC government and just want to shout out my mayor for uh, the mural that she painted on 16th Street. I think that was fantastic and it's a, quite a statement. Second thing I have to say is uh, all of us, um, our uh, past black president and the numerous black CEOs and, and, uh, and a tremendous black accomplishment is evidence that uh, you know, affirmative action of the past, the diversity, inclusion is working. Um, it's not uh, it's not a proof or, or, or a sign of times that it, it has done its job and it's in, it's time to end. It's proof that it's working. And we have to continue to uh, tout that point, that it works, that it works. And, and it works particularly from an employee uh, perspective and it's helped us uh, accomplish quite a bit as employees and and to be able to to rise up the ranks. Thank you. All this, right. Uh, I happen to be a program manager of a, a pretty big project here in, in the district. And uh, I finished a uh, civil rights meeting last week and uh, my contractor uh, made a comment that uh, because they weren't meeting uh, uh, inclusion goals. So he made a comment that, uh, come on, everybody knows you can't find iron workers and equipment operators in the District of Columbia. And uh, we, were on, uh, we were on teams, so you could see some faces and you could see people shaking their heads, yes, yes, yes. So my response was, my friend, I'm paying you $500 million, a half a billion dollars to solve complex issues in our city. Did you think you were just building a bridge? We have complex issues, we have complex issues surrounding diversity and inclusion as well. And it's my expectation that they as a company so one of the things that we're going to do uh, in coming weeks is uh, is have a uh, table within the EDE community, uh, as well as with our some of our general contracts, to really hash out, unpeel, and cover some of the issues we're dealing with, and hopefully out uh, of solutions and strategy to move forward. So what I'm saying is, hey folks. 
but please breathe. It's helpful uh, to make clear decisions. It's helped for us to uh, to uh, to be healthy and 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 so please breathe. And ways that you can get different. I'm out. All right, thank you, Dennis. Um, let's go to Ram. Ram, are you still there? Rob. Rob, I'm sorry. Rob, Rob I'm sorry. Rob, you can speak. Okay. Rob, is Nuria still, still on? Going twice, Rob. What's up? Oh, I'm sorry. He corrected us, but then he fell off. I don't know why. All right. Um, he said so, we should go back to Laverne. Laverne, did you come back on the line? Laverne McKelvey? Oh, yes. Hi. Hopefully, can everyone hear me? Yes. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Freddie, Brad, and Paul. Um, I've, I've been around transit for 45 years. But what I want to start with, well, I, I made the point about transit just to say that I've spent my life dealing with safety, and I am a passionate safety professional uh, in the transit industry. Uh, but I want to go back to what happened two weeks ago to make my point. We saw an officer who placed his knee on the neck of uh, Floyd, George, George Floyd, for some eight minutes and 46 seconds. Why did he do that? Uh, well, culture allowed him to do that. So if the question is asked, why did three officers stood around and watch this officer take the life out of a, a human being, the answer would be the culture allowed it. If, and I want to go to Paul, Paul, Keith, and Brad, if we want to move forward, one of the recommendations I would make is we have to address culture. Uh, when we talk about culture, we, we're talking about structure, norms, behaviors and attitudes, we have to change the way of thinking if we plan to move this. And then someone mentioned uh, diversity and inclusion. We have to be more inclusive in our approach. It's, this is just not, not about leaders or mid-level managers or who, this is about everyone. I read with sadness articles after articles on frontline employees who died from COVID-19 because CEOs did not provide them adequate uh, PPE. This is ungodly and it's unheard of. So, uh, you know, I don't want to take up, I want everybody to have a chance, but I would, I would just want to offer that we look at culture, we work to develop and implement a sustainable safety culture in America. Thank you for listening. Laverne, thank you um, for those words, and we appreciate you taking time to share, and hey, I'm glad you were able to come back. Who do we have next? Um, get to uh, it. We're gonna try Rom one more time. Rom? Okay, next we have Janelle Pemberton. Janelle, are you there? Please take yourself off of mute. Okay, next we have Christian Kent. Christian, are you still there? Yes, yeah, thank you, Katuri, I appreciate that. Um, you know, I wanna just say that as, as, as I and my family have been watching the news, um, you know, the there is a current in the nation right now of anger about various things. Um, whether it's, you know, I, I don't like the opposite party. Um, I'm mad because um, 
you know, uh, of, of restrictions on me about COVID. I need to get back to work. Um, you know, I'm upset because, uh, uh, you know, I, you know, I've been, you know, participating in rallies and I've had, you know, a certain person trying to rile me up <laughs> with, you know, pointing me and directing me toward things that I should be angry at and dislike. And then we had, I think, a tipping point when a military general gets up and says, you know, uh, this president doesn't even pretend to try to unite the country. And it took so long for somebody of that stature to come out and actually say that. And so many of the people in his party, I, you know, as much as I can get upset at comments that the president makes, I am more upset at the enablers. And the thing about it is, is that as I start to feel that, I'm like, well, then if I start to get angry too, you know, I haven't really solved anything. Um, you know, so it made me think of something that Barack Obama said when, uh, you know, he was uh, during one, in one of his his uh, uh, speeches, he said, don't boo, vote. And, you know, he really was right about that, very simple. Um, you know, uh, Yvonne made the comment about people being appointed to lifetime positions in the government. Um, if they can uh, pack the courts with judges who are not sympathetic uh, and who think that their job is to protect their own, uh, rather than to really be true to the ideals of our constitution and equality, that's dangerous. And when we don't show up and vote and make sure that those ideals are reinforced, then power-seeking people can come in and one day we find ourselves with the carpet pulled out from under us. This last three years has been difficult for me to be, uh, you know, as, as, as proud of our country um, because I'm like, well, you know, I'm not going to be happy if I can look around and see other people around me who can't be happy, can't be, can't be treated fairly. So, you know, I just want to say, I, I want to thank all of you for the ideas that you put out there. Um, here are the couple of things that Keith said about how more CEOs of color started to, to enter uh, into uh, the scene because there was some reflection on the criteria for, you know, what, what does the job require? What does the job description say? love to see some criteria on police officers revised. I'd love to see some criteria on judges revised. I would certainly like to see some criteria on the President of the United States revised um, because, you know, we just seem to, you know, say, okay, well, right now you can be 35 years old and a natural born citizen, and that's all you have to have to have your hand on the red button to be able to send troops against the public. I mean, this, you know, no one ever thought they would see these types of things happening. So I feel like, you know, the climate has been ripe for people to do the wrong thing. And, and in order for us to continue to have these conversations, it took somebody dying for the outrage to finally come out, frankly, from white America. I mean, I've seen a lot of white protesters out there angry, and that's good, but we're late. We're late to the show. This has been going on for a long time. So I hope that we will seize this moment, use our, uh, uh, you know, our, our, uh, our birthright as Americans to vote um, and to also demand that people who work in public service are held to a higher standard rather than to hear the news people say that it's so hard to convict a policeman. Well, why is that? You know, they're not supposed to be above the law. So, you know, I just, I think there's some, there's a lot of reinventing here that's needed. But uh, thank you for letting me speak today.
Thank you, Christian. And um, I know Rom tried to speak earlier, get Twiri, and uh, he, I don't know if he can be heard now. Rom, are you still there? All right. I know Janelle, you tried to speak earlier. Is your audio working now? Okay. Katwiri is who do you have next? I have Nikki Freeney. Nick Nikki on a cell phone. Nikki, are you able to unmute? Okay, after Nikki, we have Nuria Fernandez. Nuria Fernandez. Nuria, how are you? Hello to all of you and thank you. I can't um, use my video because it says that the webcam limit has been reached. So that is truly a testament uh, to you, Freddie, and to my dear friend and brother, Brad, uh, for pulling together this town hall, this conversation on a very, very significant uh, issue. You know, we all grew up um, talking about the prejudice and racism that we encountered, whether in school, on the streets, um, yeah, even in the workplace. And we did those conversations in the sanctuary of our kitchens, in our basements, with our families. And we walked away feeling hopeful, but we were talking to ourselves. And what this past couple of weeks have demonstrated is that we need to be talking to others and not just to ourselves. It's important, this is very cathartic. I've been listening since my, um, uh, not from the very beginning because I was caught up in another meeting, but I've been listening uh, to every single statement that has been made. And, and Christian, thanks for uh, what you shared uh, just right before I started. I, I have to say that this past few days has put at the forefront of uh, of something that most of us knew had been happening for a very long time. And each time one of ours died at the hands of law enforcement, we all threw our hands up in the air and said, enough. And then it happened again and again and again. And I have to say in, in my lifetime, I had never other than, and I was too young then for Martin Luther King, but I have never seen such an outpour of support uh, not even the Black Lives Matter has matched what we have seen these past uh, this past week and, and within the United States and internationally. And all of that is good, but it's only as good as we can make action. We can take that that power, that energy that has galvanized around uh, this ungodly incident and turn it into something that's powerful, that's sustainable, and that's gonna grow roots because that's the only way to turn the tide on this crippling racism and prejudice. Uh, and it's really through dialogue and conversation. We should not feel tempered to share with others how they make us feel if we're uncomfortable. And I, I find that a problem. And I know that uh, I, I was not born in this country and, uh, where I where I grew up it was a place where you really spoke your mind. If someone said something you didn't like, you told them, and you didn't have to be rude about it. But people knew where you stand. And I feel that uh, over the course of the years, because we want to survive in an environment and not be noticed and not be different, that we tend to speak and, and share our frustrations amongst ourselves, but don't and can't find the words um, to tell others or at least feel that if we tell them then they'll turn against us but i think we need to be we need to pass all of that and really start to figure out how we can change what has been described uh, by some of you of as an institutionalized behavior and i i don't think it's intentional by many i think it's just this is what people are used to, so they have assumed that it's okay, and it's absolutely not okay. But we have to have that conversation, and we have to invite those, as uncomfortable as it feels, we have to have those meaningful conversations so that people understand, uh, even within the APTA community, within our own organizations, 
uh, our own companies. We have to have those conversations, and it cannot be just with like-minded people. It has to be conversations that includes those who don't want to be there, but are told that they need to be there and listen. Because uh, as we go around the room and meet everyone where they are, and they understand where we are, I think that's when we're going to start opening up. And, um, and at least we're not going to be able to turn everyone but at least people would know what it is that we stand for and what is what and, and what has put us in this place where we are all united saying we are sick and tired of being sick and tired thank you very much for this opportunity Nuria, thank you for those words and um Gatori, i know we got some people in the queue i do want to go back to one of the comto board members i believe adelie legrand is now available uh to chat and should be able to unmute adelie are you there i am here can you hear me yeah Absolutely. okay well thank you um i appreciate the opportunity to talk um for those of you who know me you know i'm a pretty cerebral person i spend a lot of time thinking about things so unfortunately i've had a lot of time to think about this issue and this topic that we're discussing today um the reality is that you know, we are now focused on the George Floyd situation, which has galvanized our country and people are focused in the inequity that the black community has, is facing. But, you know, the George Floyd situation is the end of the spectrum. And there are a lot of things that happen to us along that spectrum before you get to the end, which is death. And throughout that process, we are really impacted as a community in a negative way that creates generations of disinvestment and um, hardship. And specifically, I want to state that, you know, I'm a mother of four children, two of which are male. And my son is 18. He just got his driver's license. And my husband and I have had to have conversations with him about what happens when you get pulled over by the police. But the good news is that even though that sucks that we have to have that conversation, we can have that conversation and ha help him to understand why it's important for him to behave in a certain way. But then my daughter graduated from college last year, and I had to have a conversation with her about why people don't believe that she graduated from the university she graduated from. And is it common that people want you to bring in your diploma to really see if you graduated from that school? Right? But then again, I had the opportunity to have the conversation with her to explain to her why people may ask you these questions and not to get offended by it because you have opportunities. I'm using those two examples to show that these are things as a black mother that I have to engage. These are conversations to get my children prepared to being out in the world. There are two different systems. And the reality is, as a parent, you have to prepare your child to be able to navigate in a world that has two different systems and to help them to understand that your colleagues, your friends, that may be white, that you have great relationships with, are going to have totally different experiences just because of the color of their skin. The other thing I would say is, you know, for me as a first generation American, my parents are not from the United States. Uh, my grandparents are from Panama on one side of my family. And I remember having conversations with my grandfather who grew up in Panama. And he shared with me that back in his time that there were two payment systems in Panama. If you were black, you got paid in silver, and if you were white, you got paid in gold. And what that meant is if you got paid in silver, you could only buy certain things with silver. So you couldn't buy fresh milk, you could only buy powdered milk. Um, you couldn't buy certain you know, meat, you could only buy you know, certain things. And yeah, maybe you could have the opportunities to work and get money, but again, the system was structured so that you didn't have full access. I'm using that also as an example to talk about the way forward. The way forward is really identifying policies and laws that need to be changed and we can work on collectively to get in those change. In addition to identifying new laws and policies that we would like to get implemented. Our structure is systematic. There is a system here that has been designed to allow our country to move forward. And it's great that we're having the conversation. It's great that people are standing out in the streets and making sure that their voices are heard. But if we don't have any plans and real legislation to make things change on paper, in addition to getting culture to change and getting people's minds to change, we're gonna to continue to have this conversation that we've been having for generations. 
This is not the first time that any of these things have happened. And unfortunately, it won't be the last. But what we really need to focus on, especially as Compto and APTA and other industry-related organizations, what are the policies, what are the laws that negatively impact our communities, our work communities, our members, and how can we work together and partner maybe with other organizations, other entities, to start really moving an agenda forward to change those? And I will close with this. The culture of America is really, it's owned and it's operated by the media. I don't want to quote, you know, our, our president, but there is a lot of fake news. And it's been fake for a long time. Why is it that every time you go to any city in America at five o'clock on the local news, there's a person of color who's being arrested for something? In 90% of the cases, that person isn't even charged with a crime. Most white Americans have impressions of black people from what they see on TV. And the media is responsible for that. Even now during the protests, the minority of people are looting and doing negative things. But I guarantee you every night when you turn on the news, there's going to be a segment that's focused on that. So again, we need to use our power collectively to, to address how the media portrays us and also to find ways to change policies to make it more of a level playing field. Thank you for the opportunity. All right, thank you, Adelie, and thank you for um, your comments, the passion. Um, just a comment on the media. There's a, there are a lot of people in America that never meet black people till they go away to college or go to the military. And the only impression they have of us is what they see on television or the news or some movie and how we're portrayed. And so there is that systemic issue with media as well as the, the whole system of movies and television shows to kind of perpetuate that uh, negative stereotype. So Gatwiri, who do you have in the queue on your list? Because I'm tracking and you're tracking. Um. I see Nikki Frenny has joined us. Um, we're going to try her again. Nikki, can, okay. you, can you unmute yourself? Yep, I'm on. I was on the phone. Now I'm on the app. Good afternoon, Compto. And Freddie, thank you so much, you and Brad, for pulling together this town hall so that we can, you know, all just kind of vent and express um, how we're feeling right now. I can tell you guys that 2020 feels like the, the longest nine years of my life with everything that is going on. Um, but there are a couple of things that I want to say. Um, I think a lot of our white colleagues don't really understand that for most of our lives, those of us who are people of color and specifically black, that we have had to deal with um, these type of injustices all of our lives. Black children, you lose their innocence around 10, 11 years old when we're bust out of our neighborhood and into white communities and white schools where we are treated less than. Um, I posted on Instagram this week, uh, this is my 30 year an high school anniversary and because of COVID and everything that's going on, our, our reunion was canceled. So the day that I graduated, June 2nd, 1990, 30 years to the day I posted my graduation picture and told the story about when I remember losing my innocence. I was, I was one of three black children in an honors English class at Robert E. Lee Middle School in Orlando. And our, it was, there were 25 students in the class. Our in, honors English teacher, teacher walked in the class the day after spring break and said to us, wow, if spring break had been two weeks, I would have been teaching a class full of blacks. How do you think that made a 12, 13 year old black girl feel? in a school with a teacher in a, in a classroom with coveted seats. Um, so I lost my innocence at that point and had to realize that there are two systems in America. I wanted to share that so that those of you who are on the phone that are not African-American can understand that I'm a 47 year old woman that at 12, 13 years old was confronted with something that confused me that I was not able to speak up on because I didn't know why the rest of the class was laughing and I felt different and my other two black friends felt different. That's how we feel sometimes in the workplace. Two things, two points that I want to make. One is while we're talking about police brutality and things that we may, policies that may be put into place, um, some of our transit agencies need to check their police department and make sure that those police departments are not adding to 
the discrimination and brutality that we see um, handed out at the hands of police departments for people of color. And number two, I want to encourage Compto to become more of a voice um, to support those of us um, at these transit agencies, in leadership positions, in these private companies, who uh, sometimes feel like the neck is the, the the knee is on our neck, um, and I use that to be to 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 give you guys the image of how sometimes we feel. We don't get the support. We don't have the advocacy group, um, or Comto has has not been the advocacy group sometimes for those of us that are out in the field in these transit agencies that are fighting the battle every single day to protect our jobs. Um, and I just think Compto can, 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 can be that advocacy group and speak up, send letters, you know, uh, challenge the CEOs, challenge the board when we see discrimination happening against our members and other people of color in the, in, in the transit industry. And I will leave it at that. Thank you guys. And again, Freddie and Brad, thank you so much for organizing this. Nikki, thank you so much, and uh, thank you for sharing your story and, and, and the um, the suggestion there at the end as well. Uh, Gatwiri, um, who do you have? I, I I know we lost Jay. Did we ever get to Kevin Brown? He's next. Kevin Brown is next. Kevin, are you there? Please unmute yourself. Hello. Thank you. I uh, just figured out how to unmute. Um, Hello, everyone. I'm Kevin Brown, and I uh, work for the Canadian Urban Transit Association, so the sister association to APTA, north of the border. And uh, I have just joined uh, Compto uh, in the effort to uh, create your first international chapter. I'm pleased to be on this call as uh, as my first uh, official uh, taking part in Compto. Um, our CEO, Marco D'Angelo, was not able to be here, but he asked me to pass on his wishes. Uh, he is a huge supporter of Comto and the work that it is doing. And um, our organization has made a donation to the Black Legal Defense Fund um, and, and put out a, a very strong statement. And it, it was primarily due to the leadership of our CEO. Um, I also want to say that uh, there are protests here uh, north of the border in Canada. They are protests in support of you and uh, uh, and protesting the situation uh, in the United States. But I also want to say to you that it happens here. Um, Canadians like to believe that we are a uh, better society. Uh, uh, we strive to be just, we strive to be equitable, and uh, for the most part we are, but it happens here. Uh, I won't go through all the, the, the stories, but you can look it up. Uh, there are, there's a video of uh, a, a, an, a, an African man uh, in the very same position as George Floyd uh, about a year ago, had a, a, a knee on his neck, uh, and so you have our support, uh, and we would like your support too. Uh, and this is in um, a nation that has civilian oversight of the police and really good training, uh, but there are still things to be done. Uh, now, uh, I'll tell you, I was born in India um, and uh, emigrated here when I was two and a half, uh, and I have been uh, taking the opportunity, as my colleagues have said, so how are you, of telling them uh, how I am. Um, uh, I'm angry, uh, I'm feeling grief and loss, and uh, when I say that, they're surprised. Uh, and, but uh, I have, uh, I jokingly um, uh, say that I have a track record of being randomly selected at the airport 100% of the time. Um, and uh, I've had experiences uh, that, uh, well, I won't go into it, but uh, I think you can understand. Um, so I, I won't belabor it. I, I wanted to express my support. 
Uh, I think we can all be part of the solution. And um, if you're looking for the words to uh, to uh, reach out to a colleague, the first two words are tell me. Tell me how you're feeling. Tell me what this is doing to you. Thank you. Kevin, we want to uh, say thank you and uh, thank you for representing CUTA and uh, the first international chapter of Comto Comto Toronto. So we uh, certainly appreciate that. And uh, Gatwiri, who do we have next? We have uh, Kelly Gonzalez. I see she's in. All right. Kelly, are you there? I can see him. Kelly, you're next. And um, Kelly, work out that technical issue. Did we get Eric Johnson? I saw Eric Johnson said he had some words, and I don't know if we got a chance to get to Eric. Yes. Hello? Hey, go yes. ahead, Eric. Then we'll come back to Kelly. Thank you. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, appreciate the uh, effort today. Um, I think it's good to have this conversation. Uh, have been an advocate for more than 30 years and had these conversations and been in different marches and protests. You know, it's interesting to see how things are changing now. Uh, the conversation is still the same, but the people are changing and the participants are changing. So it's, it's a very interesting process to come from back then and I know those who people who are be, before me to see from where we've been to where we are today but just know this is not all going to change in the next six months this is a, this is a protracted struggle we're going to be here we're going to be here for a while uh, the only thing I like to additionally share is a quote that a friend sent to me from Paul Robeson and he said the equal place to which we aspire cannot be reached without the equal rights we demand. And so the winning of these rights is not a maximum fulfillment, but a minimum necessity. And with that, I leave you. Thank you. Eric, Eric thank you uh, for your words. Uh, let's go back to Kelly. Kelly, were you able to un get your mic connected? OK. All right, he's still working on that. Who else do we have good get to her? Right now, um, we can circle back to Ram again um, or Janell. Yeah, I think Janell dropped. Ram, were you able to get your uh, technical challenges squared away? You have a green mic, but we are not hearing anything. Did you attempt to dial in on your phone, Ron, and turn off your computer audio? Because that might be uh, the trick. And in the meantime, we will go to Eve Williams. Eve, is you're up. And I've seen you moving around, Eve, but I'm not hearing you. <laughs> and I'm looking at you, look at your screen, Eve. And we're going to go to Joshua Salazar. Hey, Freddie. Hey, everybody. Hey. You hear me all right? Yep. Good. Hey, I just want to again say thank you for taking the time and, and allowing us because I feel like it's been good. This is another moment I feel like feels like family. Feels good to be together with our Compton family. And uh, it's been frustrating for me and painful. Uh, each of these days and and knowing this work from home status for me just is a hole in the basement and uh, it's been hard not being able to share or think or talk to people or hear other people's processing and uh, I just want to thanks thanks again for giving us a chance um, again I've loved it ever since Kim got me involved and uh, I've loved kind of participating with Compto as a family and knowing that this is a family that makes change happen and that this uh, has a family that takes a responsibility in our history to look out for so many of our minority and un unrepresented people in the country, and we'll continue to find a way to do so. So thanks. All right, thank you, Joshua. We appreciate your words. 
Uh, going back to Kelly. Kelly, any 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 work, anything working there? Uh, okay, going back to Eve. Anything working, Eve? Turn off your computer audio, maybe dial in by phone. I see your mouth moving, Eve, but we can't hear you. Are you on the phone? Okay, she is a, she I know Eve pretty well. She looks like she's explaining, but then nothing is working. We I got you. I got you. All right. Uh is there anyone else? We did schedule two hours just to ensure that we got everybody, gave everybody an opportunity uh to chime in. Kelly, and um Kelly came back in, so maybe we want to try Kelly again. Kelly. Right, yeah, you guys can hear me now? Yes, sir. Go ahead, Kelly. All right, perfect. I just, I'll be real quick. I just want to thank you and thank the whole Comto national team for having this platform for all of us to express ourselves. Um, I'm, I live here in Miami, and, you know, there's a lot of rioting, and a, a lot of people are angry here. So, um, you know, I just urge everybody to use your platforms because you're all leaders. Use your platforms to um, make the change that you want to happen. You know, here, as you know, I work with a lot of the athletes. So, you know, the athletes are more vocal than ever here in Miami. We, we're going to have some sit downs next week with some of the um, chief of police in some of the certain cities here in Miami Dade County. And it's going to be a conversation where we're asking for a change kind of going on the eight points that was written by um, Senator Sanders to House Minority Leader Schumer and um, some of the changes we want and some of the um, officers are going to ask us some of the change, some of the things they want from us. So one of the things that we're looking at is their training program and some of the policies that they have in place. So we're looking for some policy reforms. So, you know, and whatever agencies you guys are at, if you guys need any of, you know, some of the star power where some of the folks that I work with, I'm open to um, help you guys and get your word out there. And um, as you see, we do donations as well. So if any PPE that you guys might need, um, we can help with that as well. So as I spoke with Fred earlier, you know, we want to um, bring, give Compto the support that they need with some of the companies that we work with and some of the athletes that we work with, because we have that platform. We have that platform um, when it comes to the entertainment market and when it comes to the athletic market. And we want to bring that to the transit world because a lot of the times, you know, they look past us. So whatever you guys need, we're here, I'm here. I appreciate Nikki for your words, um, Tamika and everybody here that's expressing themselves because a lot of the times, you know, because we work in the quote unquote corporate world, we don't get the opportunity to really express how we want to express ourselves. So I really appreciate Compto for being bold enough and being strong enough to even have this platform for all of us to express ourselves. So I just wanted to thank you all for um, joining the call and expressing yourselves. All right, thanks Kelly. Uh, man, keep up the great work out there and I uh, look forward to catching up with you in the near future. All right. Um, Eve, I don't know if you ever got your stuff to work. I am uh, ready. All right. All right. Ready. Go ahead. <laughs> Freddie, I, I just want to first thank you and Brad and all of my Compto brothers and sisters uh, that are on the call. Thanks, Freddie, for pulling this together. It's certainly needed. I'm encouraged to see some of my active leadership here on this call. I know that this is a serious matter. Um, We've had many incidents in, in, incidents, uh, in America that have started dialogue. Those same kinds of incidents that may have started to look at our gun reform. Uh, children going out in the street and protesting against shootings in their schools. We've had the, you know, the, the, the uh, movement of the 60s, the movement of the 50s, the movement of the 80s. It has gotten the ball rolling but some of those incidents that have started the important dialogue also died on the vine. And, you know, it is the leadership of this country that we have right now that figures we'll wait it out. Um, November is coming fast, so I'm not sure that they can wait it out. It is up to us and our leadership here and across the country and across the world 
to not let this peter out. This is an opportunity, maybe the first time I've seen, I, I have to say I am old enough to remember the movement with Dr. Martin Luther King. My father was a cop during the, um, during the riots in Chicago. And I understand moving in the middle of the night. We left Chicago and went to Milwaukee, and that's where I grew up. But um, um, these things are real. They're real to your children. They're real to, to, to our future children our, and our grandchildren to come. This is legacy stuff. And it is up to us not to be silent, to take off the mask. I've, I've listened. I have nothing else really to contribute. Everybody's saying positive stuff. But at the end of the day, God has a purpose for us all. What uh, Mr. Floyd now knows is what his purpose was. And so let's not take his, his death in vain because his purpose was to move our agenda, give us the opportunity to not only have a citywide or statewide, but a worldwide conversation. So let's, let's do figure out a way forward. And I'm on your team. All right. Thank you, Eve. We appreciate it. See you soon, hopefully in person. And Twiri, I have Richard Watson. Is that who you have next? Yes, he's next. Rich, you're next. Rich, you're uh, breaking up. Hello. Your audio is really bad, Richard. Uh, can we? All right. We can go to. Uh, we got Warren Montague. Yes, Warren's next. Yeah. Okay. Good afternoon, Comto. <clears throat> oh, can you hear me? How good and pleasant it is for brothers and sisters to, to join together. It's just a good opportunity just to see so many of us uh, come around. Uh, uh, hold on, I'm getting a call on the side here. From around this country. But more importantly, what I just want to say is that I think at this time is that as we dialogue with each other, it's very important that we continue to dialogue separately and amongst our own communities. Um, this is just the, what I believe is the start. And as we break off, I see it's 116 people on this call. As we break off, there's 116 different opportunities to continue this dialogue, to continue this process, because it doesn't stop now. And if we let this die, as many things has happened, this will again be put under the covers, and and then and it'll be just another time in history. You know, I know here in Philadelphia we've experienced some major, major challenges with uh, both uh, the the pandemic, then the protests, and then the riots. I've seen communities where folks have fought to get shopping malls built up in minority communities being torn down. Um, so a part of it, there's a negative impact, but a part of this is a positive impact because people are now speaking out. So all I want to say again is that we step up as individuals and continue the conversation and continue the dialogue that this thing does not die on the vine. So thank you. Thank you, Warren. Uh, yeah, the, I, I agree with that. The, the conversations do have to continue, and we are all branches that have the opportunity to go out and continue to have this conversation. And that's exactly what's going on within Jacobs right now. It started at a very high level, and now it's going down to the local level, and we are looking to keep the momentum going, and we have to do the same thing within the transportation industry. Who do we have next? We'll get to where um, I'm going to call out who we have next, just so they know that they're in the queue. Next, we have Carlton Williams, followed by Jeff Parker, Maggie Walsh. So, Carlton, if you're still on, please unmute yourself. I am on. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right, excellent. Um, uh, first and foremost, want to thank you all for having this forum. Um, it, it's been amazing and therapeutic for me. I'm from the Philadelphia area, by the way. Um, member of Compto Philly chapter, um, and it's it's been obviously emotional for me as it has been for everybody probably on this this call um, the last couple of weeks and um, having this opportunity to just hear from others and realize that your feelings are not 
um, isolated or not just you alone feeling and thinking the things that we're that I've been thinking has been just awesome. Um, you know, just seeing you all is like first time I went to a Compto uh, conference. And so I just appreciate that because we're in that period where we can't be together right now. Um, but, you know, not to monopolize the time, the couple things that I wanted to say beyond that were that um, while this is just this uh, opportunity we are having right now to speak to one another has been great for us as my brother in Christ and accountability brother Warren just stole my thunder and said already, um, I do encourage everyone here to continue what we're doing now um, within our companies, our communities, our families, um, and, and help everyone realize that because we have a voice we have an opportunity to speak out when wrong is wrong and when racism is racism. Um, you know, on the, on the corporate level, it's been great seeing more and more companies put out statements, um, you know, over the last few days, you know, because if you're either you're silent or you have something to say, and I think if you're silent, then you're, you're allowing the injustice that's been happening to continue to thrive. And our, our corporate leaders need to know that even if they don't feel what the, the black community is feeling, um, they still have the opportunity to say wrong is wrong and we're behind you. You have value. You are equally as important as we are, if, if not more, from the contributions that we've given to this country um, and, to, and to have them step up and, and take action. You know, there are lots of things that companies can do that they need to, to move forward, have the courage and continue to do. The other thing that I'll say, and then I'll wrap it up, is that I, I would also um, recommend we consider, and I, it may have been stated or it may be planned already in place, that this kind of forum be made available for our next generation. Um, our younger folk that, you know, could vet, benefit from sitting in this type of gathering and hearing from the generation that's on here now about how we don't want this world to continue moving forward as it is, that they will have to still be dealing with the same things that we've been dealing with for the hundreds of years prior to. Thank you. All right, thank you, Carlton. And uh, who do we have next, Katuri? Okay, so we, next we have Jeff Parker, Maggie Walsh, and Maxine Small. So Jeff, if you're still there, please. Hey, can you guys, I'm here. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Yeah. Go ahead, Great. Jeff. Oh, appreciate, uh, appreciate this, this, uh, this forum. And I want to speak about, and, I, and I'll be brief, um, but I want to speak about some things um, sort of, Personally, what what's you know what I'm taking in from this on a personal level, I think it's also for me to for me to talk from the perspective of um, my leadership role as uh, as as the general manager or CEO of, of, of Marta and recognizing that I'm a uh, you know a white leader of a, of an incredibly diverse um, organization and how that um, is is impactful. And then also talk about, um, you know, the other reality that we're also a organization that has a has a police force, and that we have a responsibility to, um, you know, to to make sure that our police force is uh, is operating in a way that is uh, acceptable. So on a, on a, you know, on a personal level, I really want to thank just this this inspiration. It's been a it's been an incredibly long week, uh, you know, no doubt for for all of us and. And I'm certain that we all feel drained, but but the uh, the energy, you know, starting with my good friend Sharon, who who was eager to speak up, and I appreciate her, her words, and and I, and I miss the interactions that we've had over the years as I change jobs, and but just the just the energy and the and the comfort that that folks can give have given me here about um, the importance of me as a person, a, a you know, a white middle-aged male and how I need to uh, speak up and conduct myself. And, and it's really in line with, 
with what I hear at home. I'm the father of two daughters, one who's about to turn 20 and one who just turned 26. And, and I think we should all be inspired by the youth of our, uh, of our country and how the, the perspective that they have around social in, in, injustice and equity is just so, so different than, than, you know, when I was their age and it's, it's inspirational to me. Um, you know, I've heard really strongly, um, a, a, you know, a clear role that, that I have as a leader of an organization that, that needs to facilitate good conversation and, and clearly it's, it's not going to be comfortable conversation, but, but it will, it needs to be healthy conversation. So, so, you know, I really want to, to advance that and continue that conversation throughout, throughout the organization. So, so we as an organization can understand where, where we need to be around, um, social inequity and, and the injustices that, that, that we see way too much. And then I, you know, I'll close with this, with this really unique role that, that, you know, some of our transit agencies and, and, you know, other, other members of Comto have. And that's the fact that, that we're a police force also and, and the responsibility that we have to make sure that, um, you know, we're focused on community policing and, and connecting with the communities and, and making sure that, um, you know, that, that we're guided by those strategies that, that are just so key to making our constituents, the people that we serve, um, understand us, make sure that we have, uh, you know, a focus and, and zero tolerance policies around excessive force and, and um, recognizing that, that we all have implicit biases and, and, and need to take those head on and, and, and recognize all that. So, so I'm a little taking it all in, and that was a little rambling, but I thought it was important to, uh, to share the, my perspective, kind of personal and leadership, and then the, the unique area around policing. So thanks to everyone for, uh, for sharing with me. All right. Next, we have Maggie Walsh. And, and before we go to Maggie, I just want to say thanks, Jeff. I appreciate it. I uh, was trying to make a comment, but I was on mute. So thank you so much. Go ahead, Maggie. How are you? I'm good. I'm good, Freddie, Brad, Brad, and so many familiar friends on this call. It's, uh, I'm feeling really inspired, and I feel that this is the best way to spend my Friday afternoon with all of you. Um, I'm learning every day about how we can use our influence and spheres of influence to support everyone. So Freddie and Brad and the whole Conto staff, thank you for putting this forum out here for us. Um, I wanted to recognize that uh, Freddie and Brad and I signed a memorandum of, of understanding between the organizations of Comto and WTN. So why I'm bringing this up is I thought, you know, we're looking for action and that we can use the chapters of Comto across North America and the chapters of WTF across North America. And we can engage a broader, wider audience so that we do keep this conversation alive and well and that we do learn from all of this experience so that we can put better education out there, have the uncomfortable conversation so that we do get to a place of hopefully comfort, inspiration, success, and that um, we really do get to that inclusive environment that both of our organizations want so, so much. So I guess thank you for this forum. Thank you for allowing me to share and Again, just happy to be with all of you. Bob Prince, you're one of my favorites, ever, forever, and ever. Maggie, thank you uh, for sharing. And uh, Bob, uh, Bob, I don't know if you're going to say something. <laughs> okay. All right, Maggie, we, we appreciate you, and uh, we certainly appreciate the uh, relationship reestablished with WTS uh, under your leadership. So, um, and Twiri, I know Maggie was the last one you called prior to you. Who else do we have? We have Maxine Small, and then we have Whitney Morgan. So Maxine. All right. Yep. Maxine, are you there? 
Okay, Whitney. Yes, I'm here. I'm here. Okay, go Hi. ahead. Yes, yeah, so um, first I wanted to say, as everyone else has said, thank you for putting this whole thing together. It's been extremely um, enlightening and extremely helpful. Um, what I wanted to talk about was piggybacking on what someone said about this being an opportunity or uh, 116 people opportunity in that I um, have some people that call me, um, I would call them brothers from other mothers who since this has happened have been calling me because they find themselves at work and find themselves in situations where they stop crying for no reason. And they'll call me and say, I can't stop crying. I need to talk to someone. And so what I've told them is that this weekend we're going to get on the call and we'll talk about what they're feeling and, and what they're going through and how do we, you know, what do we, what, what can we do to um, get through those moments and maybe start talking about solutions, you know, maybe get their minds off the anger. Some One is so angry he can't even speak to his coworkers. Another one is, is, is so in a, such a violent mindset that he just wants to kill people. Oh. Right? He's just saying, why don't why don't they want to why don't they do something about why didn't they do something when he was had his knee on their neck and he's so angry i'm like neither one of those emotions is going to help you get through the day so we need to start talking about what can we do differently um what can we do to in this situation in these circumstances how can we do something because most of that is just impotent anger right we're just sitting there we're watching we're seeing these things happen and we're looking at what's going on and we're not doing anything. We want to, how can we come up with something that we can do? And just listen to you guys talk and think, you know, talk about what you're going through and what you're dealing with and, and how it's affecting you and start to think about what kind of solutions might be out there and, and whether or not there are any solutions and, and maybe taking what we're talking about now and maybe moving forward is giving me the inspiration to say to them, you know what, there are people out there thinking just like we are. And we can start being part of a conversation. And, and maybe what we do this weekend may be part of something we can bring to an, a, a, a larger forum. Maybe I can bring it back to the guys in Compto. Maybe we can think of someplace else we can do it. But I say that to say that even if we do this here in Compto and I do what I do in the weekend, if we're all doing that same thing, maybe there's a place at some point we can have a repository that we can all bring our ideas in collectively and say, and ask those questions, what does economic justice look like? What does social justice look like? What does justice reform look like? And maybe really have some answers. Maybe the, the, the suggestion about, um, that uh, uh, the gentleman made about um, changing some of the rules because they don't make sense. They really don't make sense. Maybe we need to start thinking globally, you know, about what, what we're doing out there. And so for that reason, I think, I would really like to thank you guys because it, it's really scary to listen to people, grown people just crying just because they have they just don't know what to do anymore. Mm -hmm. So thank you. No, oh, thank you, Maxine. We appreciate it. Um, who do we have next? Get to it. Um, we have three more people left. We have Whitney Morgan, Bob Prince, and James Coronas. So Whitney, you're up next. How you guys doing today? Uh, thanks, Brad. Thanks, Freddie, for setting this up. Um, I'm one of the millennials that the gentleman mentioned. I am a young person, and I'm taking heed to everything that's been mentioned today. Uh, I reside in Kansas City, a, a very segregated city. Um, and I just want to encourage you all to make a change from where you are. Um, we, all, we all have a voice. We all contribute in some way, shape, or form. So to give you an example, here locally, I, I believe 75% of the city's budget, Kansas City, Missouri, goes to public safety, and a large portion of that goes to the police force. But the police force is controlled by the state of Missouri. So what you have is the city provides a large portion of their funding, but does has no say so on what their actions are, what their policies are, et cetera. So locally, we're work, we're we're contacting the mayor. The, uh, our state legislature, our city council, and making it known that we need to have local control of our police and we need to be able to investigate and convict when there's crimes had and things of that nature. Um, a great quote by, a great, a great protest and speech by Martin Luther King Jr. is silence is betrayal. 
So you cannot be silent during this time, whether you see injustices against you or your family or against people who look differently than you because one injustice, one place is an injustice against everyone and it affects everyone. So I encourage you to, to start from where you are. As Eric mentioned, this is, this is a long time coming. This is not something that we can put a Band-Aid on and say, hey, we've, we've cured racism by, uh, even if these cops get convicted of the crime, there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, so I just encourage everyone to see how they can affect change in, in their local areas first and uh, everybody be blessed. Thank you, Whitney, and uh, appreciate you chiming in from Kansas City. Stay up, brother. Okay, get to where? Uh, we have Bob Prince and then James Coronas. So, Bob, you're up. Thank you. Good afternoon, Cocktail. Listen, hey. I'm, I'm the OG in this group, and I was happy just to listen to hear what people had to say, but I did want to tell you that one of the things I saw in this um, I've had this conversation for over 25 years. Um, I remember giving a um, talk in OCTA in California, and the people there were telling me most of the, uh, the audience was white, and they said that, that racism wasn't an issue anymore, and I said um, that it was just covert activity, and it'll be over it again someday. Well, all the President Trump has done here in this country is pull the covers off America. The DNA in this country is about racism. And the one thing I want to leave you all with, because a lot of you have sat through my classes, you've read the book, you know what my politics are, but the one thing I want to tell you, and, and I, I really want to stress, because somebody's mentioned it earlier, and that's the reason why I wanted to speak on, is tell your story. Because your young people don't know the trials and tribulations that you've gone through over these many years. They, they're seeing it now for the first time, and the only reason this has become such an issue is because we watched a murder in our living rooms. So I think that it's important that you talk to young, young people, that you tell your story, that you put it on paper. I don't care if you publish it or not. Put it on the back of a cocktail napkin for all I care. But the fact of the matter is document your legacy because it's important. And with that, I thank you all. Thank you, Bob. I, uh, I know you're a man of few words, but always um, pointed words. So we thank you for that. Um, thank you, Bob. Next, yeah. um, next we have James. Oh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for organizing this event and hosting this event. It's a great opportunity to listen and learn. Um, uh, I'm calling from uh, the northwest suburbs of Chicago, Illinois. Uh, I was born and raised out here. And to be honest with you, it was pretty sheltered. And like somebody earlier mentioned, uh, I grew up in an environment where I didn't make any friends of color until I went to college. Um, you know, and based on that experience, I then went to law school. And in law school, there were less people of color than there were uh, in college. And so for several years, I worked at a big law firm. Again, it's the white experience only. And I really didn't learn anything until I went over to Pace Suburban Bus, uh, where I've been working for the past 12 years. And in that time, you know, you learn, you meet people, uh, you get to understand that everyone's got a family just like you. Everyone's got worries just like you. Everyone has uh, uh, things that they like just like you. Uh, and being able to work with such a diverse group, uh, you know, has helped me personally if you want to call it check my privilege or at least understand what is wrong with this country because i grew up in an environment where i didn't think racism existed uh you know and and for me the betterment process is you have to listen and learn so thanks for thanks for letting me listen today but a question i have for the group is i i in my heart i don't believe that anyone is a lost soul but what is the best or most effective way uh, that you guys have found, you know, to to teach these lessons and teach these experiences to guys like me? Uh, because there's a lot of people, uh, you know, who are Caucasian and 
you know, I, I don't know how we reach them. And I don't know if anyone else has better experience than I have. Uh, but, you know, we want to we want to see how do we teach people uh, empathy? How do we teach them this experience is horrific? Uh, I, you know, I have two daughters and I would never want to have to worry uh, uh, about them being challenged for their qualifications. Or if I had a son have to worry about telling him, hey, if you have an encounter with the police, this is how you have to deal with it. Um, so I'm just curious if, if anyone's had any success uh, on the communication side, reaching, I'm not gonna call it a hostile audience, but a, a, a questionable audience or someone that's questioning uh, your experiences. Thank you. Well, uh, James, one of the, and then first of all, thank you uh, for your comments and you sharing. And I kind of cringed when you said uh, something to the effect of teaching others, because uh, some of that responsibility is certainly not on us. Um, and um, I think there has been success when we're more successful, and I'll say this from my perspective, I'm more successful when I don't wear the mask and I tell people how I feel. And I always say people don't know unless you let them let them know. And the thing that I've been telling everybody this week, and I said it at the beginning of the call is, be courageous in your conversation and don't be afraid to let people know how you feel. And that's in every setting that I go to. I refuse to wear a mask and front or cover up how I feel. And I think it's that, but the talk about receiving and learning the, I Man, there's so much I could say because in this country, the way that the educational system is set up, they don't recognize that black history is American history and they don't teach it to the extent. So not only are white folks, but black folks are shortchanged on our own history and we have to go out and do the homework just like you would. But what I, what I wanna leave with you is a paragraph that I have been reading and uh, it's from a book, I won't say what, but I'll just say this. To learn, you must wanna be taught. The proverb says, Proverbs 17, 16, availability is not the greatest need in business or ministry. Teachability is. A person may be available, but if he cannot be taught or is not willing to learn, it's no wonder he is available. It's hard to teach a man something he thinks he already knows. No one wants someone who prefers ignorance over the humility it takes to learn. And I just want to leave that with you uh, because you have to be willing to learn People can, you can talk to somebody blue in the face, but if they're not open to receive what you're saying, it's a moot point. That's really what that is saying. Um, so thank you for your time, James. Uh, Gatwiri is 357. Do we have anybody else? No, that's it. All right, I wanna say this because we are gonna wrap it up. Um, before we go, uh, there's a board member on the call. She spoke early, earlier. Uh, I want to uh, give a shout out to Adelie Legrand. Uh, today is a big day for her. She is not working, but she took time to be on this call. She is celebrating her 50th birthday today. So if everybody could unmute and give a quick uh, a shout out, happy birthday or something. Happy birthday. 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 Happy birthday telling me happy birthday at the same time. So thank you so much. Hey, uh, no doubt, no problem. And uh, I wanna thank everybody uh, for being a part of um, this uh, conversation today. Um, I didn't really get into a lot about how I was feeling, but I feel like Bob to a certain degree, you know, these conversations have gone on and on. And when I look at somebody a little elder, like Bob or even Brad, I'm like, I can't, Warren, I'm like, Dwayne, I'm like, I can't imagine how long y'all are having these conversations because I feel like I see it all the time. It's the same movie, nothing changes. And I there's a, a, a feeling of numb, numbness with me uh, because I don't know if anything is gonna actually that's going to make me. 
I don't know. A lot of people are muted. Somebody, I can't think. Um, I do want to leave with this, and Brad, I don't know if you have any closing remarks. Go ahead, Brad. I, I want to. Uh... First of all, I want to thank everybody. You know, consistently, consistently, I've been looking at these numbers, and they've been over a hundred uh, persons on this on this uh, dialogue on this call today. So I'm I'm really pleased and really excited, and we got it all turned around. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the staff for the yeoman's job that they did in pulling this together. Some of us had technical challenges, but uh, we did this on short notice, and it was a, a, a great start. A great start conversation. Uh, we need to develop some things going forward. But the one thing that has always been on my heart and that has been on my heart in moving forward, uh, yeah, Freddie, you know, I, I think I've, you know, I remember 1968 very, very well. And this seems like 68 again to me. And, um, um, but we, we came out of 68 better. And we're going to come out of this better. Uh, that's that's where I am. The Lord's going to deal with that. I'm a I'm a base, I'm an optimist. Optimist. So we're going to be better. Uh, but the other part of it is, we vote. We voted. We got we got voting rights rights and expanded voting rights. Everything that has happened uh, since then, challenging our voting rights. We need to vote, and we can't get people appointed to judges and commissions and secretaries and whatever, unless we, the people that we choose to ally ourselves with are in power. So we got to vote. And one of the things I want to do is do some kind of significant voting initiative with and through Comto in the five or six months to come, uh, come to dealing with whatever we need to do in November. So from all of the chapters, from everyone who's uh, going forward, I'd just like to kind of take an initial throw out there about what we could do to pull ourselves together and get a vote, get the vote out uh, in each of our respective jurisdictions. So Freddie, the board, everybody, I want to talk about that. I want to bring that up initially. There are other things that we can do as well, but voting is, is the base of all of this. That's going to make us be heard. That's what makes us be heard. So um, with that, I'll stop there. And again, thank everybody for being on this call today. And uh, Freddie, I'll toss it back to you. Yeah, thank you. And I want to thank the staff as well. We, we, we turned this around very quickly. Brad and I had a time. It was on Tuesday. And we got this up. I, I would be remiss. I must comment from Richard Watson uh, that I want to read. And then we're going to close out. Uh, Richard's mic or audio was not able to read. If you can mute your phone because I'm hearing a bunch of echo and background, please mute um, because it is certainly annoying. Um, Richard said, for organizations that are publicly funded or receive public funds and claim to be committed to advancing diversity and inclusion of people of color to achieve a higher level of fairness across the board, should be urged to exhibit this by implementing actions to onboarding people of color and senior executive leadership positions to broaden the perspectives of decision makers. The value add will be having access to a broader scope of social and cultural dilemmas. And who are better to express those views than individuals with empirical experiences from communities of color? That said, it be understood that hard conversations need to take place. However, they should be structured in the context of demands and guarantees to move toward real progress of fairness. So I wanted to share that with you. And thank you, Richard. And we're going to close with this. Uh, in the words of James Baldwin, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. And I want to thank you for your time. and Have a great weekend. Thank you.